Ośrodek Myśli Społecznej im. Fernanda Lasala. Chciałem bardzo serdecznie przywitać wszystkie osoby, które dołączyły do nas na Facebooku, na spotkaniu dyskusyjnym, międzynarodowym spotkaniu dyskusyjnym, podczas którego zastanowimy się, kim są współcześni wyborcy lewicy w Europie. Bardzo się cieszę, że zaproszenie do udziału w naszej dyskusji przyjęło tak zacne grono panelistek i panelistów. Chciałem przywitać panią Agnieszkę dziemianowicz bąk posłankę na Sejm Rzeczypospolitej Polskiej, politycz, politycz, polityczce lewicy, filozofstwę. Chciałem serdecznie przywitać Renę Kuperusa, który jest z nami ze swojego domu w Holandii. Bardzo się cieszę, że przyjął to zaproszenie. To ekspert Figendal Institute, a wcześniej był związany przez wiele lat z think tankiem holenderskiej partii pracy. Bardzo dziękuję za przyjęcie tego zaproszenia. Serdecznie witam profesora Przemysława Sadurę z Instytutu Socjologii Uniwersytetu Warszawskiego, członka Zespołu Krytyki Politycznej. No i witam doktora Ersta Hildebranda, współgospodarza naszego dzisiejszego spotkania, szefa Fundacji imienia Friedrichia Eberta, przedstawicielstwo w Polsce, dzięki któremu możemy odbyć tę naszą dzisiejszą dyskusję. Dzisiaj Ers Hillebrand występuje nie tylko jako współgospodarz, ale także jako, jako panelista, jako ekspert od, od lewicy nie tylko niemieckiej, ale i europejskiej. Kilka uwag organizacyjnych dla naszych widzów. Jeżeli macie Państwo swoje opinie, swoje pytania, które chcielibyście przekazać, przekazać naszym panelistom, to prosimy je zamieszczać w komentarzach pod transmisją. Te najciekawsze głosy, czy najbardziej najbardziej związane z tematem naszej rozmowy, będziemy starali się na bieżąco przekazywać naszym, yy, naszym gościom. Także jeszcze raz bardzo serdecznie Państwu dziękuję. No i przechodzimy do, do dyskusji. Dyskusji, którą yy, przypomnę, planowaliśmy już na początku tego roku. Yy, niestety koronawirus yy, popsuł nam trochę plany, bo planowaliśmy spotkanie na żywo w Warszawie. Myśleliśmy, że będziemy gości, mieli zaszczyt gości z Renek Kuperusa w Warszawie. Mam nadzieję, że to się jeszcze w niedalekiej przyszłości wydarzy, ale ten temat jest wciąż aktualny, bo wciąż partie socjaldemokratyczne, tutaj się nic nie zmieniło przez ostatnie pół roku, wciąż zmagają się z tymi samymi dylematami strategicznymi związanymi z, z tym, do kogo adresować swój, swój wyborczy apel. I podczas dzisiejszego naszego spotkania ma, jesteśmy w, w, o tyle w tej e, szczęśliwej sytuacji, że mamy przedstawicieli e, świata zach, e, Europy Zachodniej e, i e, przedstawicieli e, z, e, z e, Europy e, Środkowo-Wschodniej. Środkowo e, więc to pozwoli nam e, na pewno stworzyć taką bardziej, a, bardziej e, Komplementarną, komplementarny obraz rzeczywistości. Zacząłbym od tego, że partie socjaldemokratyczne w Europie Zachodniej, one rozpoczynały swoją, swoją ekspansję, ekspansję polityczną jako partie reprezentujące wielkoprzemysłową klasę robotniczą i były, ich rozwój był ściśle związany z z rewolucją, z rewolucją przemysłową i z industrializacją, mówiąc, mówiąc w wielkim skrócie. Potem stały się partiami catch -all, czyli partiami, które zaczęły apelować do szerszej, do szerszej publiczności, zaczęły pozyskiwać wyborców na przykład pracowników sektora, sektora publicznego. No i wreszcie lata 90. trzecia droga, czyli otwieranie się na, na nowe grupy społeczne, na profesjonalistów, na, na na inne, inne grupy z sektora także prywatnego. No i dzisiaj mamy do czynienia z sytuacją, że partie socjaldemokratyczne w Europie Zachodniej tracą swoją taką pozycję takich partii dominujących. No i jest pytanie o przyczyny i o drogę wyjścia z tej, z tej z tego kryzysu. Więc chciałbym zacząć właśnie najpierw od tej perspektywy właśnie zachodnioeuropejskiej, ale także pokrywającej się z doświadczeniami Europy Środkowo-Wschodniej i oddać głos Erstowi Hillembrandowi i zapytać się właśnie o te przyczyny i tę aktualną fotografię stanu partii socjaldemokratycznych właśnie kontekst, w kontekście bazy, bazy wyborczej. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks, Michael, of course, to you for co-organizing with us this interesting seminar on a topic which, of course, being a member of Social Democratic Party of Germany since many, many years, uh, is tormenting me because um, um, I want to see the center left in Europe to be successful again. And uh, I hope that we can find together ways to, to get this, uh, this thing done. But for the moment, I mean, the, the, um, it's not, e it, I mean, it's e a relatively easy, I think, to, to describe what has been going on and why there are fewer left-wing voters now than they have, they have been in the, in the last decades. So I think it's essentially three, th uh, due to three factors, and I will be very, very superfluous and, and, and uh, generalizing. So I think we have seen changes in the uh, social and political conflict constellations in our society that are due to changes in the mode of production, to use these ancient uh, Marxist term, uh, a shift from a nationally organized capitalism to a globally organized capitalism. This has created new class contradiction, new social contradictions, new conflicts within our societies. And the old compromise of the social democracy, the traditional European welfare state is no longer able to mitigate these conflicts. So we have some kind of delivery problems of the uh, of the traditional welfare state, which affects historical uh, uh, voters of uh, center-left parties uh, specifically. And then we have a, a third element of this crisis, uh, the ideological and political response of the center-left parties to all these changes, with, which have gone into a direction that make them less attractive uh, for working class people and uh, socially weaker parts of the European population. Now, let me please shortly uh, a little bit explain on what I, uh, how I see this. Uh, first of course, we had in the 19th, 20th, 20th century, a capitalism that has been organized in national uh, uh, frameworks, a national market, a national labor market, um, a national economy, and a national political system. The contradiction is in the, this national capitalism has been essentially the contradiction between national capital and national labor. This was a distributional uh, conflict between these two classes or two, uh, two socioeconomic forces. And this conflict has been partially or relatively successfully resolved by the good old social democratic answer of the 20th century, the combination of a redistributional welfare state and a democratic political system with a high level of representativity. Uh, and this uh, arrangement funct did function quite well and uh, did result in a relatively equal and relatively rich uh, and relatively peaceful societies that, that we all know from the golden age of the Darendorfian 20th century, uh, the social democratic 20th century. Now, this model came under co increasing pressure some decades ago with the starting of globalization. We have increasingly a global economy, we have global markets, and we have uh, a denationalization of the essential factors of economic life. We have, um, in the meantime, more or less a global mobility of the essential factors of production, which is capital, goods, and labor. Now, this new capitalism, marked by a very high degree of mobility of capital, labor, and goods, is especially strong in Europe. I think there's no other neoliberal experiment so thoroughly organized in the sense of opening markets, opening, create, uh, diminishing all kind of um, hurdles against the mobility of these three factors as the European Union and, and the European integration in the last decade. Now, this global capitalism that is based on mobility of, of, of capital work and goods has uh, created new uh, contradictions and new distribution between uh, of, of winners and losers in our society. And this uh, new uh, separation of winners of losers of this capital of this globalized capital run through in the middle through the class alliance of the historic 20th century social democratic uh, 
class alliance. The, the social alliance that has, un, has been underpinning the center left forces in Western Europe and Europe uh, 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 in the 20th century has been a class alliance between working class and lower enlightened middle classes. And the new separation of winners of losers of uh, this globalized capitalism runs mid through this class alliance of the 20th century. Working class people tend to be losers of this process. Uh, middle class people tend rather to be winner of this, these processes. Uh, working class people are suffering from uh, the effects of uh, global trade, of delocalization, of uh, raging pressure on social welfare systems, uh, and by the effects of immigration on the labor market, which increases the offer in a market that is, of course, where the price of labor is to high degrees determined by the interplay of offer and demand. Uh, now, the classical welfare state that we had in the 20th century came under considerable pressure in this globalized capitalism. Uh, it, is the, it was co-financed by the taxation of capital and labor, but capital right now in this new capitalism is increasingly able not to contribute, uh, to evade taxation, to go into, into European, European tax havens, global tax havens. So the taxation burden lies increasingly uh, only on the factor of labor. When we look at the levels of taxation that we have today in Western societies and compare them to the 1960s and 1970s, we see a drastic increase uh, of the taxation of labor. Uh, and at the same time, we see that the delivery of the welfare state is no longer as it used to be. There are considerable problems in the performance of welfare state systems uh, in most of the uh, Western societies. Now, uh, in this situation, uh, the social democracy in most countries had to, to do a choice somehow to decide itself, uh, which side do I take? Do I take the side of the pro-globalization forces, the winners of globalization, or do I take the side of the losers of globalization, those who do not profit from these kind of denationalization processes. And in the 90, late 1990s and the early 2000s, uh, at least Western European so social democracy totally sided with the pro-globalization forces, which had a logical political effect that those people who felt that they are losers of these processes tended to turn away from this center-left parties who were seen as joining forces uh, uh, with the capital, uh, with the winners uh, of these processes and not doing much to mitigate the negative effects of, um, of globalization, and Europeanization. And that's where we are now. Uh, we have center-left parties that are in most countries essentially middle-class uh, parties, which have compared to other parties uh, a better educated, better paid, uh, better well-off or more well-off uh, electorate. And we see that classic blue-collar workers, uh, working-class people are increasingly turning away and looking for alternatives, which also explains partly the rise of populist movements in Europe. So that's where we are today. And I think um, it's due to bad political choices, but also to uh, major forces, which are the changes in the mode of production of capitalism driven by technology and a lot of other things. Thank you. Thank you very much. One technical comment, if I may. We had uh, an issue in the beginning. We had a techn technological hiccup in the beginning of our meeting. I hope these problems are over now. Over to um, MP Agnieszka Dziemianowicz Bong. We are now going to move to the Central European context. While West European social democracies have had extensive tradition, long standing traditions, left-wing democratic parties uh, had been restored after 1989, hence the electorate base had been somewhat different from their twin um, parties in Western Europe because uh, actually the fundamental discerning factor had been 
based on uh, the attitude towards the past rather than uh, class distinction. So we do have the historical socio-political approach uh, based on the attitude towards the past, but that is also a phenomenon that is um, becoming slowly a thing, and it is becoming slowly a thing of the past. So uh, a question of our MP, how would you describe and resolve issues concerning that particular electorate, um, specifically uh, also uh, that the electorate men mentioned by Mr. Hildebrandt is closer to the uh, populist parties. Um, there was a slight break in the uh, recording in the, in, the, in the connection with the speaker. But now I would like to... Uh, also ask a question, uh, I ask the following question, what do you, what is your opinion concerning, for example, the development in Greece that was the response to specific phenomena? Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to see you. I'm very happy to be able to join the debate. Now, with regard to what has been said before, indeed, the historical context after 1989 and the distinction uh, that was of key importance to left-wing parties uh, has changed. Nonetheless, certain dilemmas or political choices made in the, um, at the beginning of this century, also those made by the Polish social democracy, have been very close to the problems that uh, we have witnessed, um, witnessed uh, herein. So it was, that is the ultimate question, whether we ought to be appealing to the beneficiaries of changes of transformation, or should we actually turn towards the working class? Now, were I to comment on uh, the former variation of uh, the parliamentary left-wing parties, or the uh, left-wing parties that had remained in rule and in power until 2005, the dilemmas or the mistake, uh, as has been said here, was definitely committed. Uh, for the past 15 years, um, the past 15 years, the right-wing parties have been in power. So we ought to now be asking the question, why did left-wing parties lose to the right-wing factions? I believe they, we ought to uh, refer to reasons mentioned before, the enthusiastic uh, choices of the third path and uh, uh, um, turning towards the beneficiaries of the equity of capital of, of globalization blended with the introduction of neoliberal policies. Uh, the race against the conservationist factions had actually brought so much to former left-wing parties that it proceeded to become much less attractive to the liberal electorate and also it began, it ceased, excuse me, being any kind of promise for uh, the working class or those who had been harmed, quote unquote, by transformation. Now that is the fundamental purpose. Now the uh, reason, uh, um, now where I to turn towards Poland, I believe that the main systemic reason involves the 15 years gap in uh, holding power and or any kind of agency. The situation of the left-wing parties and of central liberal parties in Poland is slightly different. Uh, in view of the results of the last parliamentary elections, we should rather be talking about a gradual growth uh, or restoring of uh, votes and support amongst the, uh, or in the, amongst the general pub public. I do believe that the lesson in the third path, uh, which turned out to be erroneous, has actually been um, processed well, as proven by the most recent results of parliamentary elections. Nonetheless, I would not be inclined to declare that we have reached the end of the road and that or that the strength of the left-wing parties is sufficiently strong, is sufficient on in Poland. It goes without saying that uh, 
the central left-wing parties are definitely should definitely be facing their own inner contradictions internal contradictions those contradictions however are not based on the attitude towards the past or the polish people's republic that has become much less controversial that is definitely a component uh, where used by the populist right-wing parties to develop their own strength but they have run out of that particular fuel currently the dilemmas are focused around strategies we are now facing certain strategic choices should we be um, selecting a tactic of uh, accumulating um, messages that we want to reach people with or should we be opting for more universal propositions um, and fashioning our messages depending on demographic structures. Now, when selecting such strategies, we have to face the music. We have to face our in-house discrepancies. Given the most recent results of parliamentary and presidential elections, it has become apparent that left-wing parties are definitely most popular with the youngest electorate and obviously uh, there are they are a minority and they are they have a much lower propensity to to vote nonetheless that is also a group uh, left that left-wing parties may be most popular popular with on the other hand we have the oldest electorate we have the oldest voters much more much more with a much more conservation uh, much more traditional when it comes to um, the public services and uh, also in terms of the attitudes towards the past obviously those discrepancies are quite extensive nonetheless we also have to focus on the issue of agency the polish left-wing parties or left-wing side or the polish social democratic parties or party have to be have to answer the question how can we gain agency after 15 years of having abandoned on the other hand agency has been handed over to those in power today and on the other uh, should we only focus on the opposition we ought to uh, understand that, um, a, that the issue of agency can be stimulated with those in power, which has definitely been uh, proven by most recent uh, polls. Given the polarization of the Polish political scene, by default, uh, um, such agency is associated with liberal factions. While that agency and empowerment can well be designed for the future under conditions of parliamentary elections which are definitely much closer much closer closely associated with programs with regard to presidential elections those pre uh, presidential elections are definitely based on a plebiscite uh, design which means that empowerment or agency is of much lesser importance here i understand uh, that we all uh, our, we are all on the same page and we have uh, been following um, election results across Europe, but the differences between the um, parliamentary and presidential elections, well, that discrepancy, those differences serve to confirm the thesis, the assumption that um, the criterion of um, announced or future uh, agents or empowerment is hugely important. Now, given the uh, his history of our past 15 years, I do believe that there is another problem that needs to be overcome. Those 15 years have brought a specific result, the traditional and universal postulates of the left-wing parties, for example, references to community values and certain universal um, solutions, for example, efficient public services, all that has been put on the back burner. Over the past 15, if not 30 years, because the previous version of left-wing 
the government had also been uh, uh, burdened with uh, flirting with neoliberal policies, had had educated uh, the Polish society in terms of identifying individual survival strategies. Hence, the major support for privatization and also the great enthusiasm concerning private education, not to mention the fact that entire sectors, such as healthcare, for example, can also, could also move into the realm of non-public private services or non-public -pri non private ownership. Hence, the, uh, hence, uh, certain, it is only the left-wing side that can appeal or offer an appeal to universal values. Now, the question of how to convince people uh, will be tying, tied in with aforementioned, with the aforementioned European agenda. Nonetheless, yet again, should it indeed be a path towards restoring European values as valuable, as um, priceless, cooperation has to be based on something else than the free flow of uh, commodities and services, or even on uh, the um, common monetary policy. Hence, the project uh, referenced by Michał Siska, that is the project of restoring the um, international um, international cooperation network or, or the uh, common spring policy and so on and so forth had actually been based on making all European policies universal for all. That specifically ties in with the policy concerning remuneration, um, the introduction of, a Euro of European minimal pay. That had indeed been an attempt or at tying in social postulates with a postulate with an appeal for opening borders and uh, creating a joint European community, a true European community. Now, obviously, we are talking about a historical perspective from today's point of departure. Nonetheless, we have found ourselves at a certain point of, point of crisis in Poland and across Europe. That is definitely an an opportunity because the myth of individual survival strategies and of individualism has actually been overcome by the crisis of the pandemic, the job market or employment market crisis. And I do believe that this is a major opportunity for social democracies, for left-wing parties to reappeal to groups uh, theoretically represented by the uh, left wing, by the left side of the political scene. Nonetheless, it is noteworthy that all policies have to be coordinated at the international European level. That will definitely provide us with an opportunity uh, of um, offering a response to nationalism and populist parties. Thank you very much. I would now like to uh, turn to René Kuperus, our guest from the Netherlands with the same question. Uh, I had for Ansela Brandt and partly to Agnes Petjemianovic about the causes for the crisis uh, suffered by social democratic parties uh, the, and the crisis of their electoral base. It seems that the Netherlands are a very interesting example, especially in Polish discussions. Not much is said that the Dutch Labour Party was one of the pioneers of the third path in the 1990s. And um, it was a party uh, which uh, remained the main left-wing party, but it lost that role in recent years. And uh, the analysis of one of the latest elections was interesting where the Labour Party lost their electorate to the Green Left and the Social uh, Socialist Party. And uh, the Green Left, uh, uh, appealed to uh, the big city uh, electorate while uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Socialist Party appealed to uh, uh, the uh, working class. 
so perhaps uh, the model for the future would be a coalition of various uh, left-wing forces that would appeal to various segments of the electorate. Uh, Mr. Kuberes, please. Okay, thank you very much for this question. I will come back to that. I will try to answer it. First of all, good evening to Warsaw from the Netherlands. Very nice. Thank, thanks for your kind invitation to participate in this interesting seminar, digital seminar. It's a pity that I cannot be with you in Warsaw. I hope to be to return to Poland after the Corona crisis, that, that we can travel again. I, I will come back to your to your question, but I will first have a small introduction. Um, at first sight, you think that Poland and the Netherlands are completely different countries. But if you look closer, I, there else are also similarities and resemblances. Because like Poland, also a country like the Netherlands in Western Europe, has is faced with a very tough polarization and cleavage in its society. We have, we have a cleavage or a polarization in our society like the Polish, but with the liberal progressive establishment at one hand and the right-wing populist opposition at the other hand. That's the cleavage in the Dutch society. The other difference with Poland is that in Holland, the liberal progressives are the establishment and, and not the opposition. Yeah, but we have two main blocks in our society, right-wing populists and the liberal social progressives. And this, this progressive social liberal bloc is pro-EU, pro-climate change policies, pro-migration, and pro-global capitalism, more or less. And we have a right-wing populist bloc against these issues, and also a small left-wing populist party, this SP, you mentioned it already, which is left-wing populist. And today it, it published its program, party program. And in this program, for the first time, they said, we want to get rid of the euro. So also a very anti-European sentiment is already entering also left-wing populist party for the first time. So the first, that's, that's the first idea. We have a cleavage like in Poland between a social liberal establishment and a right-wing populist opposition. On, on top of that, we also have in a country like the Netherlands, also we are very small in terms of geography, we have a center periphery polarization like in Poland. Then we have the big cities versus the rural areas. We have the booming regions and we have the regions of demographic decline. And that is also boiling down to electoral behavior. Populism, especially in France, but also the Brexit in the UK, Populism is a movement of the periphery against the center. Yeah, that's true in France, that's true in Britain, that's true in the Netherlands as well. The most marginalized regions in our country are the countries which have anger against the booming regions in the rest of the big cities in the rest of the country. So this, this cleavage or polarization in our country has to do also with geography, with demographic decline or booming cities. That, that's my first remark. Um, one of the problems of social democracy also in the Netherlands was more general to my, in my, to my, in my opinion is that social democracy is not an actor in the main battles of today. It's not an act that there are two battles. You have neoliberalism and, and the social democracy is co collaborating with neoliberalism, but it's not the main actor of neoliberalism. The, the, the opposition to neoliberalism is not social democracy, it's populism. So we are not, we are in the, mean, in, in the middle of that battle. Eh? Social democracy is not leading neoliberalism, nor leading the opposition to neoliberalism. So it's, it's, it's more, there's lost in that battle. There's another cultural divide, cultural battle between cosmopolitans and between national communitarian populist position. And in that battle, the Greens are at the one hand, cosmopolitan Greens, and also the right-wing populists are the other hand. And, at the, and again, social democracy is more suffering from that polarization than leading it. It's more in the middle. It's, it's, it's like Ernst Hellebrand said, it's, it's cleaved. It's, 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 it's hurt by those two battles. Then, then there's another element. 
there's a generational problem which is hurting social democracy very much. It's not only the East European young generations who think that socialism, social democracy is, is a story of the 20th century. And the social democratic socialist parties are the parties of their parents and of their grandparents. Why should worker parties be relevant in the 21st century? And that's a big question for younger generations. And if you look at the universities in Amsterdam, 80% of the students are voting for the Greens and 20% of the students are voting for right-wing populism. No student is voting for social democracy, zero. And that's the reason why the big cities, the university cities are now green and not social democratic. It's the same applies to the German SPD. We have a big generational problem, yeah? apart from problems of capitalism. Then there's another, and, and that's also already mentioned, one of the magic, the magic of social democracy in Western Europe and, and in Scandinavia is that social democracy turned their societies into middle class societies. That's, a, that's magical. And nobody is left alone, more or less, in those welfare states. They were pure, pure welfare states, middle-class societies, both the Netherlands and Sweden and Denmark and, and Norway. And they still are middle-class, social democratic middle-class societies with marginalized social democratic parties. But these middle-class societies are under threat. They are under threat by migration which is introducing a new proletariat in that middle-class society. And populism is a social democratic reaction to that, you could even say. And this middle-class society is also under threat by elites running out of their national societies. And that, that's one of the tragedies of social democracy. It's not, it's not able anymore to keep these middle-class societies together under threats of globalization, migration, and, and flexibility. And that's, that's, I think, one of the main tragedies of social democracy, that it's losing its paradise of the middle class society, which historically is a, it was a major ach achievement. And that's, that's tormenting me as well. Then my last remark, because otherwise I thought I'm, my lecture will be too, too, too long. And we are now witnessing at this moment, because of the corona crisis, a total goodbye to neo neoliberalism. Everywhere in all the countries, there's a debate going on. This is the end of neoliberalism. Even the World Economic Forum in Davos had an interview in, in the Zeit, I think, last week. They say this is the, f the end, the death of neoliberalism. So you should, you should add it because the, the strong state has returned in the corona crisis. Public investments have returned. Um, the taming of capitalism, more or less, as uh, there's a debate about deglobalization, about uh, regionalization instead of globalization. So you should, it should, it could be like the Polish MP just said that this is the social democratic momentum. At the end of neoliberalism is the momentum for a new energy of social democracy. But that's not what we are witnessing in the elections in Germany, in Northern Westphalia, or in, in Western Europe. Because there's a total paradigm shift going on that even the right-wing parties in the Netherlands are now, are now saying, okay, neoliberalism is over. We, we need a strong state. Even the conservatives are saying that in the Netherlands. So they are more or less using, abusing the social democratic momentum. And at the same time, social democracy is too much tainted by the third way, by the neoliberal era of the 1990s and early 2020s. So this, this is spoiling this social democratic momentum after the corona crisis. And I'm, I'm curious to hear about your vision on that from Polish perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think the Polish perspective will in a moment be discussed by Professor Przemysław Saldora. I would like to ask you, Przemek, about the global aspect also, because you um, study society as a sociologist, you, uh, you study lifestyle uh, societies and even local communities, uh, then uh, what uh, 
could you say about the social democratic perspective in terms of um, uh, social adhesion, cohesion? Uh, has it eroded so much that social democrats have to reinvent themselves or just change their strategy? Thank you for the invitation to this debate and thank you for the uh, prior interventions. I will uh, try to uh, relate uh, to what my predecessor said. I'm not sure if I would start uh, looking at the social democratic electorate. Uh, when I was um, thinking what to say before the meeting, I thought I have little novelties to share and uh, very little optimistic novelties at that. Um, we speak of the end of neoliberalism and at the same time we speak of a crisis of social democracy. And the, this uh, death of neoliberalism uh, is not complete yet, uh, while the crisis of social democracy is a also not complete. It seems to be a prolonged debate uh, in the last years. But uh, the previous speakers pointed a lot to the uh, genesis of the current uh, reality that we witness today. Looking at the sources, uh, we could perhaps state of the differences between East and West if we speak of Poland um, as a post-communist state is, is part of the East. Looking at it from the Polish perspective, the uh, breakthrough of 1989 and the following years uh, formed um, a situation when we were under uh, serious pressure of the West uh, to uh, transform ourselves uh, in a um, suggested direction. Transformation was a kind of social therapy where the society was to liberalize itself, both in terms of worldview and in terms of uh, an economic stance. When we were to introduce capitalist solutions to supersede um, uh, real socialism which um, fell, um, we found ourselves in a very specific moment. We introduced capitalism in a very neoliberal variant and uh, it was a radicalized version of Reaganism or Thatcherism. That was the kind of capitalism that we tried to um, introduce uh, uh, at the same time um, succumbing to the pressure of the West. It was also um, an identity crisis of the left in Poland. Uh, the strongest party which could speak of itself as a social democratic party was a post-communist formation which had to reinvent itself. And it was looking for Western solutions to do that. Therefore, the Alliance of the Democratic Left, SLD, uh, quickly became a Blair Blairist uh, casual party. And it is also hugely important to understand uh, that uh, the history of the left uh, um, told from that particular side or the alternate uh, history of the left wing is definitely a story dotted with certain discrepancies as mentioned by Agnieszka demianowicz Bonk, and it is also a struggle for agency or empowerment. Now, the contradiction, discrepancy, or paradox, uh, once we contrast the East with the West, involves the fact that we actually made attempts to copy, to replicate Western solutions, whereas ultimately, in, um, instead of importing, we exported uh, Polish discoveries, nonetheless, I think that the West is currently following the path developed in the very specific Polish conditions. Paradoxically, uh, when the, um, the left 
became a kind of catch-all structure, uh, it turned out that the left-wing parties are much more uh, social than than others, whereas the Polish right-wing parties have arisen, have grown from a social movement uh, that was the Solidarity Trade Union. In Poland, back in the 1990s already, uh, we were facing a very unique form of uh, chosen by the political scene uh, for self-development. Now, if we were to reference the a classic uh, distinction, the, the economic axis that uh, divides up parties uh, between the um, uh, um, liberal and, uh, uh, and uh, authoritarian. We actually had an over-representation of parties which uh, were conservative and hugely reactionist in their world view, but they were quite egalitarian when it came to matters of economy. Now, the left wing, when thus defined, has been replaced with a much more effective catch-all party, that is the um, civic platform, PO. Well, that was left wing that had been bled dry of any kind of uh, left-wing values, such as um, equality and a care for uh, the um, for the underprivileged and the welfare state and so on and so forth. We wanted to offer a proposal that would be a response to the crisis. Uh, we tried to launch a variety of uh, new left-wing proposals and our suggestions uh, failed to uh, get themselves rooted in the electorate. I began uh, by, uh, in my own research, to um, study the history of the Green Party in Poland, Partia Zielonych. Now, the Greens in Poland did not enjoy uh, the institutional continuity of the institutions of the late 80s, uh, when in the wake of Chernobyl, under realist socialism, the um, Green parties flourished. appeared and, flour and flourished. We had a Green Party working with the European Greens. Nonetheless, they were uh, actually created uh, to West European uh, patterns. And it referenced three key values. Ecology, obviously. Care for the um, climate in the era of climate change i.e. obviously um, ecological and environmental uh, factors, and it had been very liberal and progressive when it uh, came to mm, cultural or worldview matters. Nonetheless, it had also been a party very much uh, social and egalitarian in nature. In nature. It's shared, sharing its program with social democracies. Such were the kinds of green parties established in the West, and they, um, well, they, they, they enjoyed support, but there was no raison d'etre for such a party in Poland. It had e a problem of even uh, securing the support of 1% of voters. It turned out that uh, while pro climatic and pro-ecological, uh, Poles do associate that with a certain liberalism when it comes to worldview, the worldview, but they are also uh, quite modern in terms of uh, being um, typical representatives of large cities, highly urbanized, or once they succeeded in blending the social with the ecological, they proved themselves to be quite 
uh, conservative, uh, fearing the nuclear, and so on and so forth. So there was, it proved absolutely impossible to um, blend the three. The left began working, making efforts to uh, couple the different, uh, different values. This gave rise to the birth of the Razem Together Party, a, the Polish response or the Polish replica to Podemos, for example. Herein, the uh, climate or ecological trope, uh, while much, much, while exposed to a much lesser extent. Uh, it was present in the party's program. Uh, the obviously Razem um, focused on culture and social matters. That solution allowed Razem to um, to to extend or expand their support. Uh, nonetheless, no more uh, than up to a level of three or four percent. Now. To take matters further, uh, we had Robert Biedroń and his Wiosna Spring, uh, the, uh, a party that uh, placed all stakes on a, a program or, or uh, an agenda that was hugely liberal when it comes to freedom and uh, general world, world view. Yes, it was left wing, but um, focusing on liberties primarily, uh, while not necessarily referencing other matters. This party had um, enjoyed a flash existence, then joined forces with Razem, with, with the Together Party. Nonetheless, it turned out that the ways to uh, gain support on behalf of all these parties turned out to be a process of eliminating typical left-wing values in a struggle to secure the support of uh, urbanized um, middle class voters. Now, were we to take a look, a closer look at the, the results of most recent parliamentary elections in Poland, uh, where the left wing had simply mm, run together um, as a conglomerate of uh, the SLG of, this, um, of, the, of the left democratic alliance, uh, which obviously had been a um, an heir to the uh, previous system, uh, with the new left, including uh, Biedron's Spring, it turned out that this formation uh, appealed mainly appealed to the urban voters. Their voters were very liberal and uh, freedom oriented, highly educated, whereas the right wing gave birth to a conservative party and appealing to um, the agency and empowerment. Uh, they became they, they, they became, they, they were based on the cynicism of a catch-all party. They do not wish to win elections by, uh, to develop or uh, to deliver their programs. Over the many years of transformation, many parties could well win elections in Poland. Nonetheless, we knew that uh, what our direction was, European Union, NATO, and so on and so forth. Whereas, uh, well, the um, Law and Justice Party, um, proposed the 500 plus program, the huge uh, social benefits program, and they won. They won the over the voters from uh, small cities and small towns and villages and the working class, uh, seemingly or ostensibly the natural electorate of the social democracy. And that is a story that we know very well uh, from um, West European history. Uh, I spent my uh, last year in the UK. Uh, I took a closer look at Boris Johnson's Conservative Party. And it turned out that this was a party which uh, found a single very simple solution 
uh, that is well the Brexit way in order to improve the fate and the future of wo the working class in the north of England. And the story was quite similar in the US. Many European countries are struggling with the populist right wing side. The right wing parties are now winning middle class voters over. And that is a solution uh, which uh, we have found to be quite familiar in Poland ever since the 1990s. As part of a neoliberal experiment, uh, excuse me, that solution was put, was, was put forward as part of a neoliberal experiment. Uh, and we have not really found a good response to that. We are reaching for solutions tested in the West, whereas possibly we ought to be looking to domestic solutions. Since this is a, an issue that has um, uh, developed in our country much uh, earlier than in Western countries. Thank you very much. I suggest that we now turn to the uh, uh, I would like to ask for the next round of questions and we ought to uh, but we ought to stick to certain time discipline. Uh, that is, I would like to ask for your ideas, your responses concerning the uh, the ways out of the of the of the of the issue of the of the issue. I would like to like to start with Ernst Hildebrand, and ask him what how he sees the way out. How can we exit that discrepancy? Do you think it is at all possible for social democratic parties to develop a joint election platform? Uh, where the globalization winners and losers could come together. And I would also like to ask you about uh, efforts that have already been made. We uh, do have a cer certain attempt at uh, reviewing what had been done before, a, and uh, the Danish example is quoted as a successful return. Denmark is a country uh, where the Social Democratic Party had used very specific slogans during their campaign, for example, migration policies or, well, the more restrictive migration policy in, to meet the concerns voted by the traditional working class electorate. Do you believe that this is the correct direction or should we be seeking other solutions? Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Michael. Um, well, difficult question, and I'm absolutely not sure whether I have an intelligent answer on it. Um, I think the Danish example, nevertheless, is quite inspiring and interesting. Um, we did um, some interesting research where we tried to assess um, how distant or how represented people felt at the level of basic political and social values and uh, by concrete politic, political proposals to try uh, concerning uh, economic, social, uh, environmental, etc., questions. And we compared several social democratic parties in Europe. Uh, and it turned out that the uh, Danish Socialist Party had the lowest gaps to public opinion and uh, blue collar working class opinion in most of these questions. This is a party that has been able to bridge a little bit this contradiction between cosmopolitans and communitarians. Uh, it's credible. It is seen as being uh, caring about what uh, are the problems of people. And that's something that is missing with many other uh, social democratic parties, which are seen as very distant when it comes to core moral values uh, of uh, the electorate. So uh, I think, yeah, there, there seems to be a, 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 a possibility to bridge this gap. But for the question is from where do you 
reach out. What we have seen in the last 25 years is a process where social democracies have sided clearly with the winners, with the cosmopolitans, and then try to reach out to the others, to uh, the deplorables, to speak with uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, with some political proposals and offers and welfare state solutions, etc. Now, my proposal uh, would be to side with the deplorables, to uh, take the position uh, of the communitarians, to take the position of those who are the weakest, uh, and then to reach out to the middle classes, but to have a clear class position, if, to use uh, this old fashioned expression, and then to build the, comprom the compromise from this side, build the bridge from this side and not from the cosmopolitan middle class side as the social democracy has been trying in the last 25 years. Thanks. Thank you very much. I will uh, try to uh, confront uh, the opinion of Ernst Hillebrand uh, with um, a politician who is a member of parliament, uh, represents social dem democracy and in many declarations um, uh, states uh, that she wants to um, address the classical historical uh, working class electorate of social dem democratic parties. Uh, but in uh, the history, um, uh, the, her uh, party is represented uh, by uh, liberals, uh, well-educated and well-to-do people. Uh, so I would like to ask about this paradox and the challenge. Do you, Agnieszka, see any chances, opportunities to create a platform that would appeal to this electorate and if so what would uh, the left have to do in poland but not only that be effective well yes uh, i would not be a politician if i said that i don't see uh, such an opportunity i do see it but um uh, being low key, I would uh, see it um, this opportunity in the circumstances that have occurred, which we of course would not like to happen, but since they already did take place, then it would be irresponsible of us uh, to not find uh, uh, some sort of base and foundation in it. Um, so the crisis uh, caused that the middle class who dominates among the electorate of uh, the uh, Polish social democracy uh, is uh, experiencing what was so far the lot of blue collar workers um, of the work, uh, working class. Um, so uh, public services turned out to be ineffective. Not everything can be prepared um, with your own effort and uh, shrewdness. Uh, so um, a loss of work doesn't necessarily have to be part of that, uh, but a pauperization of uh, uh, professions which uh, were assessed as uh, uh, secure, uh, it turns out that even they have found that the um, economic uh, and uh, social crisis um, uh, has uh, made it impossible to benefit from one's own talent and hard work because uh, in a global far-reaching crisis, nobody can feel uh, safe and secure. Therefore, the uh, left-wing party should um, address that with postures reg regarding the labor code, um, employment uh, with uh, minimum wages, if not minimum wages, some postures regarding wages. Uh, especially in those who have lower remuneration in, in those sectors. 
uh, also in the uh, budgetary or public sector, uh, uh, who uh, earn uh, middle wages, middle tier wages. During one of the protests, uh, uh, during lockdown, uh, it was the protest of entrepreneurs, not workers. Uh, the uh, protesters who are not the traditional electorate of uh, the left wing, uh, they um, claim that we are all uh, workers, we are all employees. So this is an intuition that shows if we are all on the same boat, the uh, social democracy uh, should uh, respond to that. Uh, those are not the only subjects that are going to focus the um, public debate uh, now and in the nearest future. What Professor Sadura mentioned is uh, the climate crisis. And here I also see some space for the left-wing parties, how to uh, connect uh, the uh, young uh, big city dweller voters uh, with uh, uh, workers. Um, and uh, here the left wing uh, does address the matter with a clear universalist agenda uh, of a fair uh, energy transformation, uh, which uh, combines or connects to, um, on the one hand, securing uh, the uh, working class um, tiers of society and the um, climate uh, change prevention. Uh, there is also another strategy which has not been tapped as, uh, uh, sufficiently. Uh, we should speak of migration of refugees, not only as a humanitarian crisis, but also talk about it uh, in the aspect of the European periphery, not only the south, but also our region of Central and uh, Eastern Europe. And we should uh, fight on an international European arena to uh, secure uh, working conditions uh, for migrants who uh, are also, um, whose influx we see in the European region over here too. And the question remains whether a strategy will be identified to universalize the message rather than accumulate uh, uh, further segments of uh, the same middle class. I think we are able, not uh, renouncing or relinquishing our uh, middle class elect electorate, we can also, or even first and foremost, um, uh, fight for uh, the working class because this experience at this time uh, is actually developing in a natural format because of the crisis which we are all witnessing. Thank you, Agnieszka. I would like to now turn to René Kuperos. Uh, with the same question uh, for an opinion and a um, forecast whether it is possible that under this one big social democratic tent um, we are going to um, collect together the beneficiaries of globalization and the losers. Uh, uh, whether the Green Links and the Socialist Party electors can be uh, brought together under one social democratic tent for the social democratic party to be able to build the bridge between these segments of electorate? That's a very good question. The big pro problem is that this tent does not exist anymore. And one of the preconditions for successful social democracy was that there were big people's parties hey, in the 50s, the 60s, till the 90s. And the Volkspartei in, 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 in German. And those, the Volkspartei and the Big Ten People's Parties were a precondition for having these huge social democratic parties, which were able to keep together different segments of society, the working class, the lower middle class, some enlightened higher classes. 
um, and these tents do not exist anymore. If you look at my party in the Netherlands, and you, you referred to that in the beginning, my party fragmented totally in all its different constituencies. And we have in the Netherlands, we have a special electoral system, so we have a lot of parties. And the Social Democratic parties, once a very big party, now fragmented in all small parties. We have a party for academic professionals only. We have a party for the young, the Greens. We have a party, an animal party, also for academic professionals. We have a migrant party in the Netherlands, only for migrants, more or less, for Turks, especially, which came out of the Social Democratic Party. We have a pensioners party, 50 plus, only for pensioners. We have a left populist party. So this big 10 social democracy has turned into, has transformed into 10 different constituent parties. And, and I think we have to reinvent the Volkspartei by making coalitions or alliances and forget a big social democratic party. That's not feasible anymore in this time. And so the, the, the maximum we can get is an alliance around the platform, a attractive progressive platform, which is uh, more or less social democratic. But the, the big problem is social democracy has become in the last decade, both economically liberal and culturally liberal. And that's suicidal. You can never be economically liberal and culturally liberal at the same time and becoming a people's party. And that's what happened, because if you are economically liberal and culturally liberal at the same time, you are a Green Party and not a social democratic people's party. That's one of the problems. So I think what we as intellectuals of in West and East should do is to affect the, uh, the higher educated in our, in our societies to tame, to calm down the agenda of the higher educated. And that's very important because there's a clash of future images between the higher educated and the lower educated in our societies. Higher educated are pro-EU, pro-globalization, pro-migration, pro-climate change. And you see that the losers of this transition are now are revolting. And I think we have to break into this core of higher educated people around that program to tame this program, to change that program with much more respect for the losers. And if we fail, then social democracy is dead. Thank you very much. And actually, now I would like to take the full stop offered by Mr. Kuperus and uh, ask a question of Professor Sadura. In the, uh, in the uh, Polish context and international context. Uh, there was a question came in from our listeners concerning the populist parties in Central and East Europe, in, East, in Central and East Europe. Our region came up uh, with uh, certain liberal forms of communist parties um, for example, SLD, the Left Democratic Alliance. Um, and uh, once they began implementing their neoliberal neo agenda, crisis struck. But as Central and Eastern Europe also came up with left-wing parties with populist agendas, agenda, uh, appealing to uh, the um, provincial or, or, or or uh, local um, voters, for example, Smer in, in, in Slovakia, okay. not to mention the Romanian uh, Social Democrats. They also opted for such strategies. Uh, I would like to ask you, Przemek, a question concerning um, choices made by the left, scene of the left side of the political scene, Poland included. Uh, now we are, have been struck by a wave concerning the rights of LGBT persons. Uh, the um, left-wing parties had taken a very specific uh, stance. Now, with regard to what Mr. Kuperus said, do you think that the liberal agenda in terms of culture 
uh, forced uh, by very well educated voters of the left wing parties, um, very strongly rooted in, in, in social issues. Do you believe that by exposing that particular agenda, the left wing parties will be able to reach the voters that they are really after? I think that the answer here is quite obvious, isn't it? It's, uh, such a move will not let them reach a larger number of voters, not to mention the fact that this has already been confirmed by uh, polls. Uh, while the blend of three left-wing parties for purposes of uh, parliamentary elections yielded a result exceeding 10%, the result of the left-wing party candidate who had been very strongly associated with uh, this particular sphere, uh, that is the struggle for uh, the rights of LGBT persons, was very, very poor, uh, which uh, does not mean that we ought to conclude that uh, the left-wing parties and left-wing community in Poland or um, Eastern Europe should abandon human rights or uh, women's rights. Because we live in a totally different part of the world where the society is uh, much more conservative in its approach to society. Uh, well, we what we need to do is understand that we need to become more sensitive and more tactful. It is the duty of left-wing parties to protect and defend the rights of those who's, who are underprivileged and who are being attacked by authorities. Nonetheless, the left ought to stop and think about its own priorities and it ought to consider the content of its own narrative and how to self-legitimize in order to reach those whose votes they want. I am uh, unfortunately not as optimistic as Agnieszka Demianowicz. Well, I don't have to be. I am not a politician. I am an academic, uh, which ultimately means that, uh, well, even radical pessimism should become me. Nonetheless, I think that given the fact that we are just about to um, be hit by economic crisis, all of us, that does not necessarily mean that universal slogans we are going to be using will reach everybody. People are going to experience the crisis in a variety of ways. Obviously, it's going to be different for the uh, inhabitants of the Polish provinces and it's going to be experienced different, differently by a, la a manager from a larger city. The fact that we have been struck by a climate crisis, the fact that we have to now focus on energy transformation, all that does not necessarily mean that uh, we are all equally sensitive to climate-related matters, because the... Um, a miner, a miner uh, working a, in a Polish coal mine will have a different attitude to climate issues to uh, a student in the large cities, uh, won't he? I am under the impression that uh, for the time being, the Polish left side of the political scene has proven unable to resolve the issue that uh, you mentioned in your questions. Either we are approached by parties, either we are facing parties who are losing their left-wing nature in populism, or they lose uh, the um, populism of academic left-wing uh, um, preferences. And I am under the impression that I, I am under the impression that between the, well, exaggerated academism on one side and populism on the other lies the path that we ought to use to find ourselves. Thank you very much, uh, Przemek. 
I would like to use this opportunity to thank all our panelists. Our time has come to an end. Information for Ernst, if I may. Persons who were commenting uh, our discussion on Facebook are definitely close to your position in terms of class distinction. And uh, it seems that uh, it, those are exactly the kinds of postulates that they, accept, that they expect of left-wing parties. I would like to thank everybody for their participation, Agnieszka Dziemanowicz bong Przemysław Sadura, and René Kupiorus uh, from the Netherlands. I am very hopeful that we will be able to meet in Poland uh, soon. Uh, we have just touched upon the topic. We have by no means exhausted it. I don't think that uh, the uh, liberalism, liberalism is going to collapse and the crisis of democracy will not be over. We will definitely have other occasions to meet. And I hope that these uh, opportunities going to be taken um, advantage of together with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. I would like to uh, thank Ernst Hillebrand for, um, well, letting us use the premises and for joining our debate. I would like to uh, invite all our viewers to uh, join further meetings on October the 5th. We are going to be talking about taxes, a topic very important to the left-wing uh, parties, well, uh, this is something that we have also returned to in times of the pandemic. We are going to be talking uh, to uh, researchers and economists. We are going to be uh, talking about um, people concerned with taxes from different and different uh, perspectives. And I would like to end our meeting by thanking everybody who was present and who had joined us for the debate. Uh, have a lovely evening. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>